This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Chip in Tampa, Florida, on January 18, 2006. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book the Second, Chapter Eight. Monsignor in the Country. A beautiful landscape, with the corn bright in it, but not abundant. Patches of poor rye where corn should have been, patches of poor peas and beans, patches of most coarse vegetable substitutes for wheat. On inanimate nature, as on the men and women who cultivated it, a prevalent tendency toward an appearance of vegetating unwillingly, a dejected disposition to give up and wither away. Monsieur le Marquis in his touring carriage, which might have been lighter, conducted by four post-horses and two postillions, fagged up a steep hill. A blush on the countenance of Monsieur le Marquis was no impeachment of his high breeding. It was not from within. It was occasioned by an external circumstance beyond his control, the setting sun. The sunset struck so brilliantly into the traveling carriage when it gained the hilltop that its occupant was steeped in crimson. "'It will die out,' said Monsieur le Marquis, glancing at his hands. "'Directly.' In effect, the sun was so low that it dipped at the moment. When the heavy drag had been adjusted to the wheel and the carriage slid downhill with a cinderous smell and a cloud of dust, the red glow departed quickly, the sun and the marquee going down together. There was no glow left when the drag was taken off. But there remained a broken country, bold and open, a little village at the bottom of the hill, a broad sweep and rise beyond it, a church tower, a windmill, a forest for the chase, and a crag with a fortress on it used as a prison. Round upon all these darkening objects as the night drew on, the Marquis looked with an air of one who was coming near home. The village had its one poor street with its poor brewery, poor tannery, poor tavern, poor stable-yard, poor relays of post-horses, poor fountain, all the usual poor appointments. It had its poor people, too. All its people were poor. And many of them were sitting at their doors, shredding spare onions and the like for supper, while many were at the fountain, washing leaves and grasses and any small yieldings of the earth that could be eaten. Excessive sips of what made them poor were not wanting. The tax for the state, the tax for the church, the tax for the lord, tax local and tax general were to be paid here and to be paid there according to solemn inscription in the little village, until the wonder was that there was any village left unswallowed. Few children were to be seen, and no dogs. As to the men and women, their choice on earth was stated in the prospect. Life on the lowest terms that could sustain it down in the little village under the mill, or captivity and death in the dominant prison on the crag. Heralded by a courier's in advance, and by the cracking of his postillion's whips, each twined snake-like about their heads in the evening air as if he came attended by the furies, Monsieur le Marquis drew up his, his travelling carriage at the posting-house gate. It was hard by the fountain, and the peasants suspended their operations to look at him. He looked at them, and saw in them without knowing it the slow, sure filing down of misery-worn face and figure that was to make the meagerness of Frenchmen an English superstition which would survive the truth through the best part of a hundred years. Monsieur le Marquis cast his eyes over the submissive faces that drooped before him as the like of himself had drooped before the Monsignor of the court. The only difference was that these faces drooped merely to suffer and not to propitiate when a grizzled mender of the roads joined the group. 
"'Bring me hither that fellow,' said the Marquis to the courier. The fellow was brought, cap in hand, and the other fellows closed round to look and listen, in the manner of the people at the Paris Mountain. "'I passed you on the road?' "'Monseigneur, it is true. I had the honour of being passed on the road.' "'Coming up the hill, and at the top of the hill, both?' "'Monseigneur, it is true. "'What did you look at so fixedly?' "'Monseigneur, I looked at the man.' "'He stooped a little, and with his tattered blue cap pointed under the carriage. "'All his fellows stooped to look under the carriage. "'What man, pig? And why look there? "'Pardon, Monseigneur. He swung by the chain of the shoe, the drag. Who? demanded the traveller. Monsignor, the man. May the devil carry away these idiots. How do you call the man? You know all the men in this part of the country. Who was he? Your clemency, Monsignor. He was not a part of the country. Of all the days of the life, I never saw him. Swinging by the chain, to be suffocated, with your "'Gracious permission, that was the wonder of it, Monsignor. "'His head hanging over, like this.' "'He turned himself sideways to the carriage "'and leaned back with his face thrown up to the sky "'and his head hanging down. "'Then recovered himself, fumbled with his cap, and made a bow. "'What was he like?' "'Monsignor, he was whiter than the miller, "'all covered with dust, white as a spectre, tall as a specter. The picture produced an immense sensation in the crowd, but all eyes, without comparing notes with other eyes, looked at Monsieur le Marquis, perhaps to observe whether he had any specter on his conscience. "'Truly you did well,' said the Marquis, felicitously sensible that such vermin were not to ruffle him. To see a thief accompanying my carriage, and to not open that great mouth of yours. Bah! Put him aside, Monsieur Gabel. Monsieur Gabel was the postmaster, and some other taxing functionary united. He had come out with great obsequiousness to assist at this examination, and had held the examined by the drapery of his arm in an official manner. Bah! Go aside, said Monsieur Gabel. Lay hands on this stranger if he seeks to lodge in your village tonight, and be sure that his business is honest, Cabell. Monsignor, I am flattered to devote myself to your orders. Did he run away, fellow? Where is that accursed? The accursed was already under the carriage, with some half-dozen particular friends pointing out the chain with his blue cap. Some half-dozen other particular friends promptly hauled him out and presented him breathless to Monsieur le Marquis. Did the man run away, dolt, when he stopped for the drag? Monseigneur, he precipitated himself over the hillside, head first, as a person plunges into the river. See to it, Gabelle. Go on. The half-dozen who were peering at the chain were still among the wheels like sheep. The wheels turned so suddenly that they were lucky to save their skins and bones. They had very little else to save, or they might not have been so fortunate. The burst with which the carriage started out of the village and up the rise beyond was soon checked by the steepness of the hill. Gradually it subsided to a foot-pace, swinging and lumbering upward, among the many sweet scents of a summer night. The postilions, with a thousand gossamer gnats circling about them in lieu of the furies, quietly mended the points to the lashes of their whips. The valet walked by the horses. The courier was audible, trotting on ahead into the dun distance. At the steepest point of the hill there was a little burial ground with a cross and a new large figure of our Saviour on it. It was but a poor figure in wood, done by some inexperienced rustic carver, but he had studied the figure in the life, maybe his own life, perhaps, for it was dreadfully spare and thin. To this distressful emblem of a great distress that had long been growing worse, and was not at its worst, a woman was kneeling. 
She turned her head as the carriage came up to her, rose quickly, and presented herself at the carriage door. "'It is you, Monsignor! Monsignor, a petition!' With an exclamation of impatience, but with his unchangeable face, Monsignor looked out. "'How, then? What is it? Always petitions. "'Monsignor, for the love of the great God, my husband, the forester. "'What of your husband, the forester? Always the same with you people. He cannot pay something?' "'He has paid all, Monsignor. He is dead.' "'Well, he is quiet. Can I restore him to you?' "'Alas, no, Monsignor, but... He lies yonder under a little heap of poor grass. Well, Monsignor, are there so many little heaps of poor grass? Again, well? She looked an old woman, but was young. Her manner was one of passionate grief. By turns she clasped her venous and knotted hands together with wild energy and laid one of them on the carriage door, tenderly, caressingly, as if it had been a human breast, and could be expected to feel the appealing touch. "'Monsignor, hear me, Monsignor, hear my petition. My husband died of want, so many die of want. So many more will die of want.' "'Again, well, can I feed them?' "'Monsignor, the good God knows, but I don't ask it. My petition is that a morsel of stone or wood with my husband's name may be placed over him to show where he lies. Otherwise the place will be quickly forgotten, and it will never be found when I am dead of the same malady. Shall I be laid under some other heap of poor grass, Monsignor? There are so many. They increase so fast. There is so much want. Monsignor! Monsignor! The valet had put her away from the door. The carriage had broken into a brisk trot. The postilions had quickened the pace, and she was left far behind. And Monsignor, again escorted by the Furies, was rapidly diminishing the league or two of distance that remained between him and his chateau. The sweet scents of the summer night rose all around him, and rose as the rain falls impartially, on the dusty, ragged, and toil-worn group at the fountain not far away, to whom the meander of roads, with the aid of the blue cap without which he was nothing, still enlarged upon his man like a spectre, as long as they could bear it. By degrees, as they could bear no more, they dropped off one by one, and lights twinkled in little casements, which lights, as the casements darkened and more stars came out, seemed to have shot up into the sky, instead of having been extinguished. The shadow of a high-roofed house and many overhanging trees was upon Monsieur le Marquis by that time, and the shadow was exchanged for the light of a flambeau, as his carriage stopped and the great door to his chateau was opened to him. Monsieur Charles, whom I expect, has he arrived from England? Monsignor, not yet. So ends Book Two, Chapter Eight. <laughs>